Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dan Lawrence from Foreman to talk about remote mining software. Dan gives insights into firmware interaction, controlling machines from afar, and what ASIC manufacturers can do to make miners' lives easier. Dan, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate your time. Yeah, of course, man. I'm happy to be here. Good to be uh, finally chatting with you a little bit. For sure. I, th- I think this conversation is going to be really important for people who are home mining, obviously, first of all, but also a large, well, I'd say like a, a decent portion of our audience is also hosted miners uh, that have like their own farms, whether that be 100 machines all the way up to a few thousand machines. Uh, maybe even like multiple farms. So this is great information that I don't think most people will find out there. Again, we're talking about firmware, basically how machines operate, what we can do to make machines operate more efficiently, how you can control machines from afar, uh, maybe get into a little bit of the dirty details of like the the back (laughs) end of ASICs, which uh, from my experience over the last few weeks, trying to make my own home mine it's it's difficult. It's frustrating. I'm glad there's a product like Foreman out there. So maybe give us like a little spiel on yourself really quickly, how you got into Bitcoin, and then let's dive into what Foreman is proper and how remote software works. Yeah, so I can give you, a, you know, I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit. So uh, my name's Dan. Uh, I'm the CEO of Foreman. Uh, I guess I'll give you a little history on kind of how we got started. So we started back in 2016. My co-founder, um, Jake, usually the guy repping the boots with me. We, uh, we started off hobby mining. He had this crazy idea to get into hobby mining. And I was like, ah, why not? Let's give it a shot. So we had uh, a mine about two hours away from where we live, which is Baltimore. And, you know, we got into this spot where we had S9s and L3s. We made a bad idea on purchasing some B3s. That was pretty much dead before we got it. But, you know, you learn. Um, and we started mining out in this garage. It was like two hours away. And we're software guys. And remote management of it was just impossible. Uh, sometimes like an S9 would just lock up or the L3 would look like it's running hot or something like that. We had some E3s too. Those needed a little more hands on. And uh, we were just like, you know, it's, it's, it's nice when everything's markets taken off and prices are going up. But as soon as things go bare, you can't afford to keep driving two hours, 12 and a half cents a kilowatt hour to keep going up there and rebooting them and coming back. And then next day, so sometimes as soon as you get home, We got to go all the way back up there again. Sometimes we were even doing it like twice in a day. So that was where we were like, we got to find some way to manage this stuff remotely. And we just kind of looked at the scene with our software dev hats on, looking for a little bit of a kind of a sexy UI, we'll say. And we realized there just wasn't too much out there at the time. So that was kind of where we, where we started and where we built it, started building Foreman. And it kind of went from there and it's funny. I think most people think that we have, that we're big time miners, like we're, we're these, you know, right, right in this kind of software, we probably have a big mind we're managing, but I think most people are probably bigger than we are these days. So it's, uh, that's, that's kind of how we got started and where the whole idea kind of came up. So it's just been a wild ride ever since. For sure. And before we dive into hardware specifically, I'd be curious to get your take on the mining market over the last two years, because I, I think when most people think about Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining is probably the, like the third or fourth thing on their list that they might be interested in. And so it's always interesting to talk to people who staked their claim in the ground with Bitcoin mining back in 2016, back in 2017, because it was kind of a backwater for a little bit. Like I think between the two bear markets or between the two bull markets, rather, it's pretty quiet, pretty quiet. And now, obviously, it's been real good to be a Bitcoin miner. If you're around at the right time, you're doing pretty well. From your position, what has this last bull market been like and where do you think we're going from here? It's incredible. So, I mean, when we started, we used to be, you know, we're just trying to figure out how we're going to get a hash rate on the platform, how are we going to get some users on the platform. But we're luckily to have a little more traction these days and and the volume that it seems like is coming into, into 2022 and what's going to kind of be, we're looking at for like the end of 2022 and into 2023. It's, it's incredible. So I think we're going to see a tremendous growth in the network hash rate. It's going to be this is a, it's a great time to be alive. I'll say that it's 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 gotten in just incredible over the last year, um, and just looking at the network hash rate, everything coming out of China, everything coming to the U.S. and there's so much capital coming into the space too. We get on these calls now where it's people are just kind of coming in and they're like, 
you know, I want to build out a Bitcoin mine. How can you help me with that? They just, they've got the money and they just want to throw it at it. And, and the conversations we get into with like power providers and everything, it's, it's incredible and very bullish on Bitcoin mining, that's for certain, from a utility perspective, but then also, you know, the network as a whole. It's just, it's a great time to be alive. Totally. And fitting in the firmware element to this, what are most people using for firmware? How are most people interacting between their miners and their servers and their farms and managing it right now? Uh, maybe you can give us like a little backdrop on what it was like prior. You, you said earlier in the conversation that there wasn't really anything. And that's my understanding is there's like a few firmware types out there, like remote softwares, but for the most part, it's pretty empty. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a difference between firmware and kind of management software. Um, so we're kind of more the management side. Uh, from the firmware side, I think there's pretty much just a couple of leaders, you know, uh, Vanish and some of the some of the ones that spin off that um, brains and everything. Uh, I think there's generally a lot more interest in that people that are kind of running at a smaller scale because they're trying to find a way to optimize their investment. And I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, from the management side, though, you know, there are there are other we have some competitors in the space. Um, I think we're lucky to be one of the only U.S. ones. So that's what makes us kind of interesting and in how I think we were able to successfully capture a good chunk of the, the market. Um, but yeah, you know, from, from the software side, there wasn't a whole lot when we started, uh, we were kind of competing with desktop apps and stuff like that, and a lot of homegrown solutions. And I think the nice thing about kind of what we've done is we kind of came in from a different angle. We, we, we are software developers. We know how to write good software. We didn't come in from the, we're miners first. We're definitely software developers first. And I think that's what makes us kind of competitive in the space. You generally want some people that are software devs, uh, building the software. So, you know, if I asked somebody at say HUD8, how do you identify professionally? They'd say, I'm a Bitcoin miner. And if you ask me, I would say I'm a software developer. So I think that's what sets us apart uh, and how we kind of are able to provide this solution that a lot of people are just kind of anxious to get away from internally homegrown software or desktop apps to something that's a little more you know professional and maybe full featured and able to help you run an operation at scale. I think you made a good note, note that we probably should have started off in the conversation earlier. The difference between firmware on a machine proper and remote software that can control a machine from afar. Could you define those two things and tell the audience a little about how they interact together? Yeah, sure. Sure. So firmware, uh, basically every miner has firmware on it. It's that interaction between the software side and that physical side that actually kind of makes the bits work and actually solves all the math. So the firmware is the piece that's kind of living on the device, what makes it perform a certain way. Um, the management side, kind of what we do, we're, we're, hand, we're off the rig. So we're kind of designed to be a bolt-on on the network. Uh, so we don't actually go into the device. We don't actually modify the software on the device. We are effectively running on a PC connected to the same network where all the miners are. So we kind of query them via their APIs, collect all kinds of stats, give you some nice ways to bring all that up to a dashboard and then say, all right, you know, it's say Thanksgiving. There's a big pool outage. I need to do a mass pivot off of some pool that's no longer, no longer reachable. I'm just going to go into Foreman and just say, check all these miners, pivot all the pools off to something in North America, and then I'm back up and mining in a minute. So we provide that off the rig management software, whereas the firmware actually lives on the rig and it's actually what makes it kind of work. And that's where there's people that focus on that space, like Brains and Venetia and all, they actually write firmware that lives on the rig to make it perform a little better or perform in, di perform in different situations like immersion or air or something like that. We are more of the tool to say, all right, the firmware is able to do immersion or air we will make it so you can have just one way to configure all of your rigs to be ready for immersion or air. Totally. And what kind of teams are you guys working with right now? Uh, obviously, everyone needs remote software for this at some point, right? Like most people aren't living next to their Bitcoin mining farms. Uh, so it's nice to have a remote system. Um, we, we definitely do a lot of business more and more with public companies. Uh, so people that are publicly traded. Um, I think ultimately... They're looking for a solution that lets them manage their devices at scale, be that 10, 20, 30, 40,000 miners. When you get to that scale, there's definitely a lot of different problems you have, sometimes just from the people aspect of it. So traditionally, people were running BTC tools or something like that, managing the devices locally all on a desktop app. And you lose a lot of accountability there. You don't know who did what. Um, you don't know when they did it. You don't know who changed the pools. So you could have somebody at site at 2 a.m., run BTC tools, there's no central platform for auditing with that. And they just do all big pull chains across the entire farm. And now you don't know, you don't know when it happened. You don't know 
kind of who to hold accountable. So when you come to kind of a platform like ours, um, we're able to kind of put it so the operators can all effectively be in one kind of box and you can configure permissions and everything and kind of limit what they can do. So now you, as say, say, Will, you got your own big time public company and, you know, two maybe miners. I- yeah, two miners, and it's, t- it's time to go public. Hundred thirty and- terabytes. Let's go. <laughs> two miners, time to go public, and then you hire me as an operator, and you want to make sure that when you're asleep, I'm not changing the pools on you. So now you can configure some custom permission sets and all that. So you can kind of limit what really happens there. So I think there's a lot of interest from the public company perspective, just all that accountability. Um, we also do have a lot of good business with with hobby miners too. Um, you know, when you make this investment into something that might cost ten, twelve thousand dollars, you want to be notified immediately if something goes wrong. And traditionally, that can just be fixed by rebooting the miner. So we give you some ways to kind of automate those reboots too. So I think I think there's pretty much uh, um, an appeal to people at both ends of the spectrum. Definitely. Let's talk about competitors. So when I was first looking at this for my own home mining setup. I was going through a few options, and uh, the only one that really popped up easily was Minerstat and Foreman. Minerstat, I tried to do some stuff with. It was, it was okay. Uh, the thing here that is interesting is it does get technical kind of fast. It, almost no matter what system you're using, I think. I think from the stuff I use, Foreman was the easiest. I'll give you that plug really quick. Hey, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a free one right there. Uh, minor stat made me go into command line on, on my Mac and like, I can do that. I don't love doing that. It's going to take me about 10 times as long as, as a developer, as a coder, but I can, I can work around it. If there's some instructions, typical person's not going to want to do that. And for home miners who are getting into this, they're probably around the same level as me. Like they, they know how to plug in an ASIC. They're thinking about how they want to keep the ASIC cool, thinking about airflow, noise, they probably know how to log into the miner itself, or hopefully they do, and uh, you know put the IP address into the, the browser bar and start playing around with it a little bit. The options out there, just somewhat limited. What other competitors are out there right now, and how should people be thinking about using a remote software system for their at-home mine? Yeah, um, there definitely are competitors, like you said. So Minerstat... Um, Props to them. They do a lot of good marketing. I think that's something that we've generally always struggled with. We always focus on product first and trying to really advance the product and make it make it work well. Um, I think what sets us apart is we started off again back in 2016, hobby mining, got into GPU mining, and we still GPU mine today. But it's quick. You're quick, quick to realize it's hard to scale a GPU mining operation because those things you think your ASICs need some TLC. You have no idea when you start having all these fans. It's just so many moving parts that go with a GPU rig. And they can be a little finicky sometimes too. You overclock it a little bit and then all of a sudden it's rebooting every three hours and you underclock it a little bit. And finding that sweet spot and then your profile that you come up with for overclocking doesn't isn't consistent across all the cards you have. Each one performs a little different. So it's just very we kind of took that strategic move. We were like, there's just no way people are going to be running at scale uh, with GPU rigs, kind of really, really big scale. So we took the move to let's say let's let's focus on ASICs because I know that I can take it out of a box and plug it into the wall. And if I had enough money, I could maybe do it 10, 20, 30,000 times. It eliminate a lot less moving parts, a lot easier to scale, and they're a lot more predictable. Um, so we started off with that. That's kind of how we focused. I think that our competitors generally are a little more B2C focused. They're a little more um, you know, somebody they want a lot of people with a lot of GPU rigs. Um, we want generally fewer customers with a lot of ASICs. Uh, so we're more B2B software. But that's that's the competitors in the landscape. Um, I think that you know we've been working with ASICs for so long that I think we've gotten it pretty easy to use. Now, unfortunately, the biggest hurdle is that the people that build the miners are not always thinking integrations. They're not thinking, who's going to be querying my devices? And how hard is it going to be for them to actually get my devices running on a management platform. So if I could go back to 2016 and I knew how hard it would be to speak minor, never would have probably done this. But I'm lucky that we're past all of that now. We can speak minor pretty well. But the issues that you get into are like with what's miners. If you wanna if you wanna remotely manage them, you have to first run the what's miner tool and you have to open the API 
And then you, that that lets us then do a reboot or a pool change or something, all user initiated. But there's just no way to do that unless you have, it's like this two-step process, which makes it a big pain. And then you look at who's got most of the market share, Bitmain. Uh, they build a tremendous product. But integrating with that thing, it's like um, it's like I'm like like my tools are two rocks and I'm just like banging rocks together. It's 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 just nobody's kind of focusing on integrations yet. And I'm really excited for this new Intel route that's coming out where I hope that they take a different approach. You've got somebody that knows how to build this kind of stuff coming into the space. And I'm excited to see how the integrations look moving forward. But that's definitely uh that's probably what you experienced a little bit when you were saying, oh, you know, I had to run the What's Matter tool and open the API and everything. That's what makes it a little bit of a pain. And unfortunately, that's just, that's the box that that these manufacturers put us in. And it doesn't make, it looks like, man, you know, using forming can be tricky, but it's just, it, we're, we're so limited and that's what makes it such a pain. So, yeah, no, I apologize I'll, that it was bumpy for you. No, no, no. Uh, I think that's the, the opposite Thing I want to give away is like using the back end of these miners is the bumpy thing. But once you start integrating to something like Foreman, it gets so much easier, so much more quickly. And yeah. That's why there's a product, right? That's why people aren't using just the back end of your miner directly because that would be just endlessly frustrating. That's why things like Foreman exist. Uh, so maybe we can kind of pick, paint the picture for people who are not home mining because some of our audience is going to be home mining and they've logged into the back end of their miner. They know how to like configure it a little bit, but a lot of people are probably scratching their heads or hearing words like APL or API or what's minor tool, or they're hearing back into the minor, they're hearing sure. firmware, and they're probably getting a little confused. Uh, so let's, let's do an example of what this would look like. If I'm setting up my S19 in my garage right now, what are the things I have to do to get it online and hashing? And then how do we integrate it into Foreman? Yeah. So if you're just going to, if you have one S19, you can kind of view that as like setting up your cell phone. Uh, for the first time. So you went out, you bought a new iPhone, you went through that interactive process, you entered in, oh, you know, will at foreman.mn, maybe, you know, Uh, (laughs) you enter in whatever your email is, your password, you set everything up. And it seems like, oh, it's pretty easy. Now my foreman's up and running or my my, my cell phone's up and running. Now imagine you had to do that 30,000 times, configure your cell phone 30,000 times. That's where it gets to be kind of a scalability problem. So when you're configuring it the first time, you're plugging it in, um, you have to find the IP that can sometimes be a little bit of a hurdle because you just plug it into the router or your switch or something. It comes up with an address and then you have uh, no idea where it is on the networks. Then you got to run some IP scanner and you got to find it. And then you got to open up the web page and then you have to configure your pools and everything. So it's, it's, it's still bumpy just to kind of get going from that side. You can't just plug it in and it's not like you're looking at a nice screen on the front of it and you can just say, Oh, go to this pool, this thing, away I go. It's it's still very low level, um, even without manage, without the management software. Totally. The yeah. nice thing that we kind of add to it is you're able to now plug the device in and then you just basically plug it in and let it sit. So we'll focus on like an ant miner. You can plug it in, put it on the shelf, and then you're just working Foreman from there on out. So you, you have our agent. I'll assume you've already set up your Foreman account and everything. Um, it'll walk the network, find that device for you. So you don't have to actually go through that process of trying to find the IP and everything. You can just say form and go ahead and walk it and find it. And when you find it, bring it up into my dashboard. And if you have some of the automation turned on, we can actually catch that it's a new device and auto apply a pool change. So it actually makes it very easy to be running at scale. And now you can just kind of plug them in. And as you're going through the racks, Foreman's on the back end, just saying, oh, new miner showed up, configure pools. New miner showed up, configure pools. So that's where um, the management software can really start providing a lot of a lot of power. Um, and we usually work closely with some of our larger customers to try to figure out how to minimize uh, their their onboarding process as much as we can. So we'll, we'll go out to site um, we'll talk through them over the network and everything, figure out what it's like to try to get up in mining and try to figure out how to automate as much of that as possible. But yeah, I like to always, I give the cell phone analogy a lot. So imagine configuring your cell phone once and how much time that takes. And then imagine doing it 30,000 times without the management software. It's a big task. So that's where we kind of come in. I think you're being a little humble as well. Like the, the cell phone <laughs> thing, it's, I actually set up a new cell phone yesterday. It's pretty slick. Like I just took a, like a photo of the, new screen phone with my old phone and then start transferring the, the data, some sort of secure connection between the two. Yeah. I don't know if it's using Bluetooth or something. 
start onboarding quickly, just pop right through it. New cell phone was set up in a half hour. I only had to do a few clicks. Setting up a new <laughs> machine, on the other hand, like <laughs> just taking a step back, you have to plug it in. You have to get all that stuff to get it done, right? Pl- making sure you have a 240 at the very least, airflow, heat. And then you have to start worrying about the tech stuff. Like you said, you have to push that IP button on the machine, download an IP scanner from the internet, sweep for an IP, take that IP, plug it into your browser, open it up. And then you have all this information that you're like, oh, I have no idea what this is. If you're a new miner, you're like, okay, what's a giga hash? You might have not heard about that. Do you only know Terra hashes? So that might confuse you. You might be confused about fan speed. You might be confused about what a PCB chip is or a PCB, uh, like the, the, the temperature probe on it is. Uh, all this stuff can get very confusing. And that's why it's nice, especially when you're going to scale, to have something like Foreman that automates all of it very quickly. And I can see as you get from one machine up to you know thousands of machines, you definitely have to have something like this. Uh, I want to go into machines more specifically. Mm-hmm. So when I was setting up my what's miner, so I have, I have two S19s and one what's miner. And the S19s were actually much easier to set up uh, because it just basically plug and play, you know, just set it up really quickly that I felt like the dashboard was set up a little bit more easy for me to understand what was going on when I was onboarding mm-hmm. my machine. The what's mine on the other side, and you alluded to this a second ago, I had to download a separate tool, then I had to run that, and then I had to go into it, enable some commands so that Informer could work with it. Yeah. As opposed to the ant miner, it was like, oh, recognize Foreman immediately, start plugging and playing. When you're looking at different machine models, and it doesn't just have to be like Bitmain or MicroBT, when you're looking at like Kanan or InnoSilicon or maybe even GPUs themselves, what are the differences you have to think about? And do you have to program every single one specifically to work with Foreman? So from the user side, no. Um, you just basically say, hey, Foreman, I just plugged in some ant miners. Go out and find them. And then once you find them, it, effectively, you're, you're kind of done. Um, you get out of the platform as much as you put into it. So if you configure some of the automation in there, and we have some guides on how to set some of that stuff up, it can get to the point where as soon as it finds the miners, it gets them configured. Um, if you don't have something like that, that means if you buy a what's miner, you buy a Kanan and you buy, um, a Bitmain and ant miner and you plug all three of them in, you have to know what the management interface looks like. And none of them look the same. Avalon's or Kanan's have their own interface. Ant miners have their own interface. What's miners have their own interface. Some of them use root root. Some of them use admin admin. It's nice from the management side, from the software side. You don't even have to actually worry about that too much. We'll actually map the correct password for you and everything. So it, it can be tricky. And I remember setting up miners back in the day myself manually before the software existed, just finding out what the password is. Sometimes you're like poking around on Kanan's website and you're trying to find stuff and you're finding some Chinese documentation. I don't read Chinese at all. Um, and it's just hard to find out sometimes just to how to even log into them. So it, it can it can be a lift, but ultimately, you know, I think anybody can can do it. It's just how much time you want to put towards it. So if you had 10 miners, you could manage 10 by kind of by yourself, just going to each management page. Um, it just gets to be a scalability problem. And especially once you get into some of the larger deployments, a lot of people are putting a lot more scrutiny on security too. So now you're getting into a spot where maybe you have a security auditor coming through. And the first thing they hear is, hey, every device on our network is root, root, and admin, admin. They are immediately going to say no more. Because so, that, 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 that opens the door to things like viruses and all that and bad firmware and everything with the, with the S17s. They knew that 99.999% of the minds in the world are running root, root, or admin, admin. So what's the first thing you're going to do? If you're a bad firmware, you're going to talk to all your neighbors and spread yourself because you know that everybody's using the same password. So that's where um, even if you're able to effectively manage those miners, like those 10 miners um, kind of on your own and log into each password, each, each interface and keeping the passwords the same, usually once you start to scale, you want to start rolling in different passwords, isolating things to different VLANs or different segments of the network. Um, different passwords per VLAN, possibly different passwords per network segment. So there's there's a lot of ways that it can become very very tricky to manage miners from just that management console, especially if you're doing password management and maybe you know I'm an operator at Will's Will's future Pubco mining company, and maybe Will actually made the passwords Will01, and I'm expecting roots. Now I can't actually log into it, and I don't know how those passwords are managed. So it can become very tricky, especially once you start 
once you start to run at scale and you start putting kind of security first and thinking about how to isolate things. Yeah, let's go back to security in a second, but I want to open the can of worms. What tools are available in Foreman? So when I'm looking at my dashboard, the ones I've interacted with so far, uh, and this maybe this is like a good little customer survey for you. The, the things yeah. I've interacted with so far have been uh, seeing how my miners are performing. Mm-hmm. Temperature has a really nice interface for seeing like how hot my chips are and, and if there's any like airflow issues because of that yeah. or indicating airflow issues. And then power consumption is another thing. Uh, basically, if you want to like turn down your miners' power a little bit, or turn it up. Uh, those are the things that seem to be like available in Foreman. But could you walk us through what kind of features the software enables to be remotely controlled? Yeah, so you can do um, getting all the miners just on board is pretty quick. Um, we have a couple ways to get them in there. One is you can do a network scan, and it'll just find everything in Atomal. Another neat thing that we have is a lot of people like a visualization of their racks. So they like to be able, it's called sitemap in our system. Um, they like to have this nice little grid that's like you're staring at the front of a rack and you want to see where all your miners are physically located. You talked about temperatures a little bit. So seeing how those temperatures are distributed in the rack, we can provide you that visualization. And that comes down to at onboard time, you can actually press the button on the front of each miner in a certain order and we'll catch all those signals and build out this visualization um, of the rack and kind of keep it live so you can see how your temperatures are distributed. What that lets you do is then you can do a lot of position-based things. So with Foreman, you can reboot miners, you can change the pools, um, you can push out static IPs, you can, um, depending on the firmware, overclock, underclock, um, change cooling modes, immersion or air, Um, you can blink LEDs. So if you're integrated with Sitemap, maybe me and you will, we're running this big Pubco mine. We've got three containers and I want to say, all right, I'm going to inform and I'm going to filter down and say, show me just the miners in containers one, two, and three. And then I'll make the LEDs blink on all those miners for the next 20 minutes. And then me and you will then run through each container and look for the ones that aren't blinking. And that's how we know the ones that are dead need to be taken off the shelf. So we can do a lot of commands, a lot of a lot of position-based stuff when you're integrated with the sitemap and everything. There's also some some automation too. So if you were to say, uh, it's a hot day coming up and I don't want my miners to overheat and lock up, I'm going to say if a miner, it's very if this, then that kind of structure. So you can configure your own rules and everything. So I could say if a miner gets too hot um, for 10 minutes, I want to automatically put it to sleep. And then optionally, maybe I want to automatically wake it up 10 minutes later. So kind of let it go to sleep let it cool off, um, automatically bring it back to mining. So if you were struggling with some of that heat in that box that I think you were working on not too long ago, oh, uh, yeah, that, that, that might've been a way to help with some of that too. <laughs> that <laughs> so, was yes. frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So, so pool changes, reboots, factory um, resets. Um, so the pool changes just change what pool you're mining to reboot. Sometimes if the miner stops hashing, it just needs to be rebooted and that'll kind of bring it back. Factory reset kind of takes the miner back to the way it was right when you got it out of the box. Um, so that can be a useful one. If sometimes you get into this spot where you don't know what you've done and it's not working anymore, applying a factory reset might be a good way to bring it back. Um, blinking LEDs, putting miners to sleep is a really big one. Um, we've got a lot of use on because people are ending up kind of being in situations where they have to bring their power consumption down and then bring it up later, some sort of demand response or something like that. So we're able to help with some of that stuff. Um, I think that's high level. Most of the commands you can kind of run through Foreman, but it's nice mm-hmm. you get it all from one one page, so you don't have to run the what's miner tool and manage all your what's miners, and then go yeah. to each bit main uh, management interface one at a time. And then Avalon, I think, has their own desktop app. So if you were mi- running a farm with thirty different miners, each all different brands are going to be running three, four, five different apps. So it's really quickly to be responsive when you have to run five or six different apps. So let's, let's turn back to security here. And this an interesting question that we get a, a lot is, can people steal your hash rate and what would that look like? Uh, to my understanding, like most machines can only pay out to one address. And so like splitting between different addresses is, I don't know, maybe not infeasible, but my understanding is not possible. Um, and, and then there's obviously things like where you can take over someone's machine or, I don't know, like log into it, cause some malware. Can you lay out the security concerns from a a remote software like this and how a machine could be compromised and what would that entail? And maybe even correct me if I'm wrong about uh, how payouts can work for a machine. I mean, I think what you're saying is exactly right. So when you think about how custom firmware works, like 
Um, I think brains might have a little bit of a different model. When you think about down to like how Vanish works, there's the concept of a dev fee. And it's effectively the same thing that happens poolside where there's a pool fee. So your miners are sitting there doing work. Um, and at some time, at some point in time, you have to effectively pay the developer or pay the service that you're mining to for letting you use that platform. And ultimately, that comes down to how a, sh- how, how a share gets routed. Um, so you can sometimes see if you're running custom firmware, you'll see that brief period where your miner might change over to a different pool, a different worker that will very quickly submit some work to that pool. So effectively paying that dev fee and then it'll come right back to you. Uh, so that's that's kind of how people can steal hash too. It's it's um, it's it's quick to do it from the share level. Um, you can also do it kind of at the the stratum level, changing workers, changing pools, and all that stuff. Or if it's bad firmware and it's just going to go out and spread itself across the network, some of those viruses and all that used to exist and probably still do, um, they would talk to all the neighboring miners, um, kind of close off their remote access so you can't get in there and actually change the pools anymore. Close off. Uh, SSH, so that protocol that you can use to kind of get into the miner and reconfigure it, close all that off and make it so you can't even reconfigure them. So they change the pool, steal your hash rate, and then lock you off. So you're kind of put in this spot where you've got, say, 10,000 miners, and now you're going to need 10,000 SD cards to actually go through each one and reload the, the firmware on each one physically. And that becomes a big time sink. So a lot of ways I think hash rate can get stolen, but ultimately it comes down to kind of the same thing that happens with a dev fee where the share gets routed to somebody else. That's awesome info. Uh, yeah, I think that's a under reported point about security. It's not only like I have to go through and put an SD card and all these things, but as these mining firms go big and they, as they go public and there's, legal contracts around these things, you need to have really smart firmware and really smart remote software uh, to make sure that you're protecting your hash rate because there are ways of sealing it. Uh, Last question for you as we start closing up, what do you want to see from manufacturers going forward? What, As someone who's building software for miners themselves, what are the kind of things that you'd like to see built into these machines? And I'll just give as an aside, it's fascinating to think of an ASIC like an S19 being a $10,000 machine and yet it doesn't have nearly any of the functionality (laughs) that my $500 iPhone does. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously there's huge trade-offs here and they're purpose-built for different things but at the same time you think at some point you'd start to see a few of these features just be purpose-built into the machine. Maybe you would be able to sense the temperature around it right then and there and start tuning itself down a little bit uh, I don't know exactly what other options would be out there, but you know, you'd think you'd see a little, a little bit more innovation. Uh, and it seems like secondary or third party applications like Foreman are the place where that's starting to be built out also on the firmware level, obviously as well. But I'd be interested to get your, your take on where manufacturers should go next. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, a lot of people are really getting more into the energy side of things. Um, so they're always looking for ways to kind of turn off quickly and turn back on quickly. Um, so I think that it's it's very interesting from our side that a lot of manufacturers are not producing heavily towards that space. Uh, so to give you an example, when you put an S19, depending on the firmware that you're running, what version it is that Bitmain might have released, uh, when you tell it to sleep, Sometimes it can take up to like 30 seconds to acknowledge it. And you don't know when it's actually taken the command. You just have to wait until it says, got it. So if you're thinking putting 30,000 miners to sleep, how can you do that if every single one takes 30 seconds? So we do things in parallel to really cut that time down. But ultimately, I don't understand how products kind of leave the facility with something that takes 30 seconds just for you to say, I need you to stop hashing really quick. Or when I want to come back, I need you to start hashing again. So it's it's interesting that kind of they're, they're, they're building these devices that do something very special purpose, but they're getting used in ways that I don't think they were intending. And I think there's a, 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 a misalignment there. And then from the integration side, uh, I just want something that's easy to integrate with, man. It's, it's nuts, the fact that there's like, let's just say 15 or 20 manufacturers out there, and none of them look the same. If somebody comes to us and says, hey, Foreman, I've got this brand new device that I want to manage with your software, I can guarantee you we're going to have work to do because nobody builds to a spec. Um, there's this thing called like CG Miner, and it's very loosely kind of the way the API, the interface to the miner is kind of structured, but there's just no consistency to 
your interpretation of it versus my interpretation of it versus what's minor versus Bitmain's interpretation of it. So there's no consistency, very hard to work with. And then sometimes they actually have an API that will let you do things, but it's very, um, it breaks between firmwares. So maybe the 2022 oh, January version might work a certain way and they come out with a February version and now it all breaks again. So they're not really they're not really putting kind of good software devs, I would say, on the firmware side. You can you can tell these things are built by hardware manufacturers and then they kind of focus on the software later. We'll just make it work. Kind of invested all the capital into the board design, everything. Let's get it out the door. And then there's a lot of, I think, left on the table regarding what it what it's like to actually use these things from a management perspective. So I think that's where I, if I could have, you know, a wish list item, it would be please make these things easier to integrate with and let give me a lot of bells and whistles too. Let me let me do more with performance profiles. Let me overclock, underclock S19s without having to go, you know, third party stuff. Just just. You know, I bought the device. Let me kind of do what I want with it. Yeah, quick follow up there. I've heard that a lot of the S19 firmware currently is like pretty much black box at this point, or they're looking to go that way more and more. Uh, do you have a feeling for where manufacturers are on the spectrum of allowing more functionality and uh, third party integrations? Uh, so I think What's Miner definitely set uh, an interesting trend, I think, uh, in 2020 or so, where they kind of deprecated their old. Um, programming interface, their API, uh, in favor of one that gives you a lot more kind of capability, a lot more ways to uh, programmatically reboot it, change the pools, change the performance profiles and everything. So I definitely like interacting with uh, with the What's Miners a little more, and they seem to be giving you neat ways to kind of make them turn on and turn off quickly. Uh, I, I wish it was consistent across versions, but that's a different conversation. It's interesting from Bitmain. Um, you know, it's they don't seem to think too much API. So that's the uh, that's where I wish that they would kind of, you know, maybe take one step back and figure out how do we make this stuff kind of a little easier to manage. Um, but, you know, I'll keep praying and eventually it'll get there, hopefully. <laughs> Dan, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. We'll definitely have to have you back on in the near future to talk more about uh, mining firmware, remote hosting software, and all that good stuff. Because I think it's, it's there's a conversation a lot of people haven't thought about but as home mining takes off more and more people are going to be looking for these resources but thanks again for your time yeah thank you too it's great to be here